So you had the uh, the LA premiere last night. Yeah. So you have, what's that like? Is it is it like you're seeing all your old friends again, or saying goodbye to them again? Uh, I th do you know what? We we only finished this one. I think that was well, this summer because we had to go back for reshoots. So there's not that much distance between the end of this film and it having been premiered. So there's a, a dual sense of finality in some aspects um, of the film when you go to a premiere. For me, anyway. You know, and you sort of catch up and then it's work orientated but there's a certain level of excitement that comes with that and with this one um, because we've been through so much together I hadn't seen the film until last night as well so wow yeah because I'm working as well on something at home is that right. taboo? yeah yeah with that yeah. I cannot wait I'm really excited about it are we going to see it here in this country? yeah it's with FX here cool um, so it's um, BBC and FX and it's kind of interesting because we've got we, me and my father, Steve and I, we, we have a, a story which we pitch them, and uh, and what we're shooting with Christopher and I on now is not quite the same as what we pitched them, but it's taken on this organic development, which is, which is exciting. And, uh, it's going to so you have some real um, creative, collaborative involvement yeah, in this. Yeah, once you start the cameras running, you start to see that you know, what, what you have there and how it, you know it's not exactly what we set out to do in the first place but that was a good jumping off place so you know it's just become this other, other thing which is you know fantastic and exciting which is bad for me it's, a, it's, a, it's the first time I've ever worn a, a sort of producer's hat and I find a, you know, the, the difficult thing about that is that <clears throat> I don't have anybody to rail against in any way shape or form like I normally a, a good executive project production council provides me with a ball to bounce my tennis ball like a wall to bounce my my tennis ball against and complain about certain things or facilities or assets that we may or may not have or how things could be done better if I were in this situation now I'm in that situation now. it's quite a humbling <laughs> just I have to moan at myself so. well my question there would be who did you rail against when you were freezing your ass off this one um well, we had a lot of comms issues on this one. Logistically, this is, I mean, I think that the, the biggest, if you take away the obvious, uh, what, a lot of, what a lot of attention is about uh, the endurance of being in the snow and it being in adverse conditions and harsh and a struggle and, you know, man and nature and it being a force of nature and, and, and uncomfortable and all the stuff the actors went through. And actually, that's nonsense. That wasn't. The case was where we it was cold. We can't. Remember. That's common sense. It's, it's cold there. You know, we knew that going in. And cold helps you in in some way, right? In because terms of your performance. To a degree. I mean, yeah. I mean, to a degree, it's going to enhance certain levels of. Um, if you're living in a, you know, if you're doing a movie about a hostile sort of environment, and, and the environment is a character, of course, it's going to inform that rather than a soundstage. Um, would or very clever design or CGI. Absolutely. Essentially, the Revenant, for me, one of the major characters is the landscape. Is the, that's it. And the Chiba beautifully captures that. And, um, what fascinated me that. about the, the... Sorry to interrupt you. I'm oh, no. so worried about the time. Um, uh, the idea that he's working close up. Yeah, he's got a funny old lens, hasn't he, on that thing. I, I'm, no, I, you know, I'm not much of a cinephile, so I, I, don't really, I can't explain technically what was going on there. But... Um, he, his cameras, like, you can get this, I don't really know how to explain it, but you probably know much more than I do, but you get this huge widescreen background shot, and then you've got a very serious close-up at the same time, and it, 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 what he does with the camera is incredible, and, um, and also kind of distorts the face in a strange way, or the body in a, in a way that, you know, it's very specific uh, and unique to Chivo, like Alejandro. So Fantastic. was it for you a case where you didn't necessarily know where the camera was going to be? Yes and no. I mean, you knew where it was, but it was to, Alejandro had a, a, a process which was unusual um, for me. I had to learn the language where, um, this was an orthodox, if I was talking to somebody, I would be looking at them in the eyes, whereas, uh, and doing a scene as is, and, you know, whereas with Alejandro, he would maybe potentially in a situation ask me to stare over here, and do my scene with you know another character who's standing here, and talk back and forth, and then the camera would move off me onto this guy's face and then around, and it would look like we were looking at 
or something. So some things were a bit sort of unusual, and he said, you'd have to trust me. And you couldn't see playback, so you quite know what you were trusting, or how that worked. But it, you know, then, uh, then later on, he started to see what he was doing by showing us some playback. It, he, the penny dropped, and I, and I understood what he was doing. It's a purely technical filmmaker thing, where someone just bog standard actor is like, well, I'm talking to this person, so why am I looking over here? This is, you know, common sense. He deconstructed that. So the guy you're playing, did he exist in the history the way Leo's character did? Do you know what? Did? I'm, I'm a bit more to do any research. So I finished Legend and I went straight onto this. I had time to grow a beard and turn up, you know, get a wig on, get up the mountain and open my mouth, and that, that was it. So what you see is what you get. And, uh, so why does Hugh Glass drive him so crazy? Because he's a racist? Why does Hugh Glass drive him crazy? I, I, you got, I don't know if um, Fitzgerald is a racist from uh, from the get-go, as in, like, uh, seems like a traumatic learning behaviour from something that's happened before, a deep mistrust of somebody, because he's scout. You know, he has, he's obviously had a backstory, so his uh, vehement racism doesn't come from a place of uh, spite and uh, for unnecessary, unnecessary motives. Not my take on it, anyway. There's something about it, in much the same as uh, you know, so you see in Vietnam movies about the VC or Charlie or you know uh, with Sergeant Barnes or something. Like there's a distinct dislike for the enemy, which is specified in a, in a, a slur or racist slur. But the, there's, there's not a consummate racism in him. I don't think so. there's a terror, a fear of the First Nation male, and I think a deep distrust for anybody that's in bed or. Less you know, time with that because you know, it means he's going to get killed again. It's about Talks. survivor. Yeah, and, and I, I don't. I think somebody like Fitzgerald would choose the common denominator, the lowest common denominator, to create provoca- provocation for anything that's made him uncomfortable. I think ultimately his best friend is himself. So Inaritu let you run with that? No, not initially. No, he was very uh, controlling about absolutely everything. You know, his, uh, that's his way. But that's. One has to create trust. He'd ask for trust, but the trust has to be earned, and, and that was, you know, uh, that was quite. A, it was an interesting bridge to get over because, you know, you, you, when you're playing someone like Fitz, uh, you have to feel confident to to take some some risks and make some bigger choices to hold on to, to build an arc over however many months you're playing the character. And if he holds on to the character for too long, then redundant, that might be be there. You know what I mean? Because uh, if I have to do everything that he's saying, uh, then it will never get to my bones or my heart or my soul. Essentially, I can't ground the character if the character belongs entirely in Alejandro's head. So there was a there was a certain wrangling. Uh, whilst he learned to trust me, I assume, whereby I could have fits to portray him for him, but I don't think he actually trusted any of us to play our characters the way that he saw them. Wow. Already. Does that make sense? Yes. So we had to wrestle them off of him. Uh, before Leo they too? Free flow. Pardon? Leo also? I don't know. I don't know. I think, I th- I think this is largely unconscious behavior that was going on. But he had so much to concentrate on Alejandro. He must have seen everything. And we fill those yeah, spaces yeah. in his head. But some of us have to breathe essentially a life into that and, and have ownership. Otherwise, we don't know where we're standing. Especially if he's asking us to look over here or position ourselves in very unnatural positions and then breathe life into something which is to be fair completely counterintuitive to anything that one would learn in an orthodox situation of acting which he would call the tightrope and it works on camera as soon as it, it clicks together on camera you can see what he's doing and it's you know it's brilliant but inside the driving seat of practically applying that within the ensemble it's like learning black russian you know it's, it's, it's confusing and where and did your point that I, I, I didn't uh, oh, keep finish going. was the logistical what oh, made this please. endurance piece for me in my understanding of, of the revenant well, wasn't the nature of the harsh weather concerns and stuff like that that we were asked to do anything particularly difficult but what it was was logistically to move a huge orchestration of team and uh, departments around very you know hard to access areas of, of remote landscape do you know what I mean on a daily basis in such a short space of time to catch a um, I think we had an hour and a half worth of filming time a day and we'd do six hours of rehearsals but then we'd shoot in a natural light for an hour and a half a day and then set up for the next day because if we didn't get it on that day we'd have to shoot it but yeah, 
next day and constantly chase these scenes if we didn't get them in the can, and then move the entire operation you know, to somewhere which is 300 kilometers away with a 12-hour turnaround for eight months. You know, and we didn't know what we were shooting the next day until sometimes six or seven hours before we had to turn up. You know, the communication, the logistical, was what made it an endurance piece in that hostile environment because the weather dictated what we would shoot and you couldn't control the weather. So did you bond with each other under those conditions? You already knew Leo. Yeah, I knew Leo, you know, uh, so there was no bonding that needed to be done in that aspect. We were all in it together and it was a, a question of, you know, how, how are we going to get through it all? This is a huge beast and when does it end? We called it the forever then because it was going on forever. And you were taking very small pieces of ground, and uh, you didn't necessarily know what was being shot. You knew the scene you'd shot, but you didn't know what was being captured of the vision. And so sometimes that you can get playback, you can get a concept of the director of what's going on. But she and Alejandro initially were very private about how they contained their, their special, whatever their special was. It was like, what the fuck are we doing? What are we doing? And it came to a point where eventually, you know, like Leo sort of breached reached the playback area and I've got in as well to see what it was they were doing and at that point it was a, a lot easier to articulate you know uh, because a picture can tell a thousand stories whereas dialogue you, a lot gets lost in translation so if you could see what it is that you wanted you go ah I've got it okay right get it and then it sped things up exponentially for me anyway I can totally understand how unsettling that would be how 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 uh, did you come up with the accent you just did it. Yeah. But yeah, it just turned up. I quite liked it. I just thought it sounded kind of cool. It did. <laughs> it did. I'll go, with, I'll go with that. And I did, you know, I did. I, I love Tom Berenger with the two and Sergeant Barnes, so I thought I wanted to get a little bit of him in there because he was such a, he was a character that I, as I was growing up, I, I really sort of was drawn towards. I thought, oh, I'd like to pay homage a bit to him, to be fair, that character. So there's a bit of him in there as well. Well, the other thing I love is legend. Oh, I am a that. huge. Oh my God! I've been I've been pushing this since Toronto. I've been oh. wanting to talk to you about that since Toronto, but you oh, haven't wow. been you haven't been around. Um, that looked like it was fun. That was fun. That was seven weeks we shot that. Whew. That was now that was fun. Whew. I mean, this was fun. This was eight months, I and mean, it's epic. And then you do something like Legend, which is like seven weeks, and like dun, 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 dun. very different type of film. But you're also on your toes playing both of those characters yeah. Yeah. and the difference between the two of them and the bond. Yeah. yeah. So just quickly, because uh, they're going to drag us away, logistically, did you, shooting with yourself uh, in a scene, like in the bar when they're fighting? Super easy. That, yeah? Uh, complicated. In, 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 how, how do we do this? And then I had to work out some basic admin. I don't think much has changed because we didn't have a lot of CGI and have much money. So it's, it's very much sleight of hand and... You know, smoke and mirrors, really, and split screens, and tennis balls, and you know, earpieces, and use a lot of uh, voice to um, to interact with the two brothers to cross over, so you can create a clash, a sound clash, because I think your eyes pick up what you hear sometimes. So you'd see an argument, yeah, like that, but if you took the sound off it, it wouldn't be kind of as pure, like the eye lines for that, as when you add a voiceover over the top, and you could mute one character whilst the other one was talking and then have playback in the ear and then interrupt the other actor. So we'd play with the vocal dynamic. And once we, um, once the chair, the, you know, the, the, the penny dropped on, I could interrupt myself through dialogue, then I can interact with the brothers a bit more. I know that sounds, doesn't make a lot of sense. I know, no, it? I get it, I get and it. To try and blur that line between the, the same actor playing the same two different characters, that was what the challenge was. was like, how can you blur that line? as often as possible, so it feels like they're two different people. So I, I really they were both try. great and really fun thank to you. watch. Oh, and, you. you know, one was really sexy, and, oh. and the other was really scary. Oh, um, and I thought Emily Browning did a great job, oh, too. she's awesome. Oh, she's awesome. I think she's going places, yeah? Yeah, she, she's really special, Emily Browning. Really special. All right, and then the other, of course, is Mad Max, which I'm sure... Uh, I've been rooting for that all year long as well, and luckily it's coming around. Yeah, that all is the out. critics groups and all the awards groups are seeing the light. That's great news, isn't it, for for George? I'm so pleased for him and, and, and Margaret as well. What that you know, what George has done with the 
Fury Road was just fantastic. It was like a, a total renaissance of, you know, of not just action movies, but you know, like bring Mad Max back and, and, and with all his toys out. And just such a massive explosion of Technicolor brilliance and orchestrated madness at its peak. So my question for you is the scene when uh, Furiosa has, there's one bullet left in the gun. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. And you, Max, Mad Max, uh, I'd miss. you pass it to her. Yeah. And you give it to her yeah. to take the shot. Because I'd miss. Did you have any trouble with that? No. The reality is I would miss. And you know it. <laughs> and she wouldn't. Because it's her gun. I, don't, I think if it was any gun. To be fair, it was just, I think, I think the great thing about Mad Max is he's real. He's not that confident. He's not that confident. He doesn't think he's going to make it. You know, and, and if, if someone's got a better idea, you know, you hand it over. If someone's better at, than you at something, the smart person hands it over on numerous occasions. Because he knows, who, who, you know, what he's good at and what he isn't. Thank you.